So thank you very much, Brahma Tirtha Prabhu, for joining us today. It's a pleasure and honor to have you. And uh, I was thinking we could discuss today on the topic of um, intellectual outreach in our movement, or intellectual out and within that we could discuss uh, various initiatives that are that happened historically and what are the opportunities now. Okay. And of course, we could talk about uh, your role in currently, especially helping devotees uh, re recover the or create recreate to some extent a framework for. Bhaktivedanta Institute. Okay. So, you know, I came to know about you, of course, through most, like most other devotees, through the Perfect Questions, Perfect Answers book. And, you know, that was probably one of the most uh, appealing and accessible intros to Krishna consciousness because the question answers are so attractive. And over the years, uh, as I came to uh, I came to America and I met you, it's I just appreciated how multifaceted you are. So how did you uh, means were you a part of the Bhaktivedanta Institute from the beginning or because currently you are working to re to revive or restructure the Bhaktivedanta Institute to some extent? Maybe you could tell yeah. me a little bit about your role and involvement, and then we can go forward. Okay, um, sure. Um, when the BI was formed in the mid 70s, I was the absolute best geologist in the entire Krishna movement. I can say that because I was also the worst geologist in the Krishna movement because I was the only geologist. <laughs> okay. um, so uh, I can claim that uh, with no humility. And um, uh, I, Srupa Damodar Maharaj, a brahmachari then, approached me and said, um, we're doing this BI work, and there was Sadaputta and Madhava and Gyana, and Rabindra was working with Rabindra Sarup Prabhu, and said, we'd like your help. So I started working with Sadaputta, preparing a talk for the first international conference on Life Comes From Life. That was in 1976, Vrindavan? Well, that was in October 77 in Vrindavan, but we started working on this in 76. Okay. And um, um, I wasn't sure what to do. In fact, I had no idea what to do. And uh, we've all been in that circumstance where we're given a challenging service and we just don't know what to do. And I was, you know, so young then, just in my 20s. And um, the topic of the conference is life comes from life. What is consciousness? And I was asked to speak on evolution. Because evolution, Larry Theory, says that there was a primordial soup. And in the soup, there was a lightning bolt. And then after that lightning bolt, amino acids formed and amino acids then evolved into whatever's little tiny one cell things and eventually it came into us mm. and so that's the materialistic paradigm because there's no consciousness is is a material creation so Prabhupada wanted us to respond to that so here i am a young geologist whose specialty was hard rocks, not fossils, asked to write something. So at the same time, in those days, anybody who's read Shama Sundar's book, uh, Chasing the Rhino, or uh, Yamuna's uh, biography, or um, uh, Mukunda Maharaj's Miracle on Second Avenue, understands that in those days, things were very miraculous because it was something that sometimes we forget and that's called Krishna magic as you, that's a term Yamuna coined like mm -hmm. one day uh, Shama Sundar and Malati were in LA in, in London they didn't know how to pay the bills and they're walking down the street and money starts pouring out of the sky and we threw money out of a window they don't know what happened so they gathered the money and paid the rent. It's called Krishna magic. And 
sometimes we lose our connection with Krishna magic, in which we really come very, very dependent on Krishna. So at that point, I had to become very dependent on Krishna. I didn't know what to do. Hmm. Damodar asked me to help. We knew this was dear to Prabhupada. So I, I met Sadaputta, and then we became uh, you know, lifelong best friends after that until he passed on. Um, and I had a job at an oil company. I was a young geologist in Houston at an oil company. So then Krishna magic took over. So I went, I told the company I was researching some geological theory for an oil well, which is sort of true, but that was the easy part. So I spent hours at the Rice University Library, ostensibly the research of the company, really trying to figure out what do I speak on? And out of the corner of my eye, it's in the library, a magazine caught my eye. And I grabbed the magazine, and it was an article by Stephen Jay Gould, the famous paleontologist, mm. and Eldred Niles, the famous curator of the Museum of Natural History in New York. There's an article on punctuated equilibrium, their yes. new way of looking at evolution. And they were trying to solve this problem. They came out with the original article in 72. And then in 77, they said, we've had this out for five years and no one's defeated us, so we declare victory. So this was their victory run. And the article dealt with a problem in evolution. And the problem was this. We find virtually no missing links in the fossil record. Hmm. Yet we find that you see in the record one species and then another in the geological record. But you don't find the in-between. And it was always, well, we just need to look harder. Well, after looking harder for 150 years, we still didn't find it. So they had to respond to this. So they responded to this in a clever way. They said evolution occurs so fast, it, it takes isolated uh, geography with strained environmental conditions. That's when evolution occurs mm -hmm. by a process called speciation, which means all of a sudden a lot of species appear. Uh, and then one of those species will become the survival of the fittest. So it's not survival of the fittest of individuals, survival the fittest of species and it happened so fast it's not preserved in the geological record and it happened so slow though in geological time um, in our time that we actually can't see it happen so we never see it because it's too slow but it's too fast to be preserved in the geological record so it's that in between so I said, there's something wrong with this. So Sadaputh and I started applying math to it. I mean, he was the math genius. And um, that was the paper I gave at the first international conference of Life Comes From Life. Okay. And that's how I got involved in the Bhaktivedanta Institute. And it was a great honor to be there one month before Prabhupada left the world in Vrindavan in our suits mm -hmm. and ties. There's a famous uh, iconic picture of us scientists in suits and ties. And at night, Prabhupada was too sick to go to the conference, but he'd call us into his room and say, what did they say? We had some very famous, world famous scientists come there. What did they say? And how did you respond? He wanted to know what our arguments were and their arguments. So every night we would give Prabhupada our Sankatan report. And he said there was nothing more important than this. So then I went on to other services, BBT, uh, running a Gurukula, uh, different services over the years. I would work on and off with the BBT, but the, and with the BI, I meant to say. But the BI had some problems in that people in the BI didn't get along with each other very well. Mm. As Kali Yuga, we expect this. And so then I realized the smartest person I know for BI work by far was Sadaputta. And the and there was no one smarter than him. So, but he 
when you have that much intellectual prowess, he wasn't very good at dealing with people. So I became his buffer to help him deal with people. Oh. And I helped him in any way I could for many years. Now, meanwhile, Shri Damodar Maharaj, his brilliance is in reaching out to scientists. He was brilliant at it. No one could make more friends with big shots than Shri Damodar Maharaj. He was so talented that way. I just, just admire how he could walk up to people, very big scientists, disarm them, and get them engaged in a dialogue and to come to his conferences. So we had Supdhamadhar Maharaj, who had this incredible ability. You had Sada Putabu, who had a great intellectual ability, but they actually couldn't work together very well. Mm. And so the BI became somewhat splintered. Um, and um, Bal I think the stress was because of their respective strengths itself, if I understand. Sada Putabu wanted that more papers should be published and serious yeah. research be done, whereas as Sarodhamadha Maharaj wanted more to have relationships with people instead of getting too entangled in uh, too much of a hardcore research. So it is a different I, vision I, yeah. of, of yeah. how outreach could be done. Was it through more through networking and relationship building so that they appreciate us or is it that we enter into their field and we actually do hard, uh, we, we do deep research and present so what was it was more a matter of vision that was that caused the differences, isn't it, to some extent? Some it is. I sat down with Rupdamadar Maharaj and I said to him one time, How do you see this? It's so hard for us to get along and manage. And he said to me this very smart uh, analysis. He said, In any organization we have to have a balance between democracy and autocracy. That's interesting. In democracy, you have to have, you know, people have to be able to give an opinion. Even Prabhupada said, sometimes we would vote who would be the leader. And then you need autocracy. Sometimes you just have leadership and, and make decisions. So he says to balance autocracy and democracy can be very difficult. And he admitted to me, he says, I am struggling to figure out that balance. He was very... You know, I really am very humble about it and very forthright. He says, and it hasn't worked so far very well. So he was struggling with how to figure it out. Shubhdhan Maharaj was extremely intelligent, and he understood that this was a hard balance to achieve, especially when all of us were so immature. And people who work in the Bhaktivedanta Institute tend to be Brahmins. And Brahmins need to be facilitated, not managed. <laughs> and and, um, and there, were cultural, there were cultural differences. We had Indians, Americans, Europeans, and there were cultural differences. And so Shukramana understood that this was problematic. And he said, just, you know, Krishna's just going to eventually reveal how we balance all this. And so things went on, and Sada Puta started writing a lot of books. And that was his real forte. And we both live near each other and would meet every week. And so we worked together. And then he passed on, Sudhamadar Maharaj passed on, both very sad occasions. Um, Rasharaj Prabhu, um, uh, who's a, a brilliant physicist, uh, began his work, you know, he was doing his work in the 90s and up to now on uh, uh, quantum physics and the definition of matter. Uh, so he, he found his niche for BI work. And what happened here is some devotees, Sunanda and the late Yamaraj and Stita D. Muni and Prishni and Tamraparni, they wanted to get Sadaputta's books back into print. Mm. So they worked tirelessly for years getting the books back into print. Sunanda made a YouTube channel of Sadaputta, and I started working with them. And one day we were sitting together, and um, Tamraparni said, Let us make a BI out of this. And I had sort of given up that hope. 
And I said, okay, let's think about it. So we formed a BI branch and started. And I said, okay, I'm going to learn from all the right things Sadaputa and Sudhamadar did. And I'm going to learn from what didn't work. And I'm going to really take into my heart some of the instructions Sudhamadar Maharaj gave me, but was figuring out how to make it work, how to balance democracy and autocracy. And so we formed a BI with these principles. One, we're going to have, we're not, we're going to talk everything out. We're not going to have infighting. Everything's going to be according to Upadesh Amrita, relationships among devotees. And we were by now mature enough to pull that off. We weren't 20 years ago mature enough to pull that off. If anybody really wants to be a naysayer, and we had two that way who were with us, I would take them out to Krishna lunch and suggest they find another service because we didn't want sniping. Then we decided to follow a very important instruction of Prabhupada. In 1974, Prabhupada sent a letter, I think it was to Rupanuga Prabhu, in which he said, I want all your PhDs. The idea of the BI was forming. Send me all your PhDs. Well, all three of them. There weren't any. So we decided to do a conference in January 2019. Um, we got some funding, some from the BBT, some from grants. Uh, and we gathered enough funding to put on a conference called Consciousness in Science. What is conscious? This was our follow-up to the 1977 Life Comes from Life. And we had 50 PhDs come from all over the world like okay. six Russia. And um, so we're following Prabhupada's instructions to gather. We want to see what there was. And we did a uh, three-day conference. 400 people came to opening night. The mayor opened the conference. It was held, um, at, began in the facility University of Florida. So we did what Prabhupada suggested. Some world-famous scientists came and world-famous devotees came. And... Uh, following the in the footsteps of Sri Dhammadar Maharaj on how to meet important people and engage them. We put on a successful conference. This Some of last Sub year? What's that? When was this? Last year? January 2019. Oh, okay. I have a video of this that we showed the GBC. And we invited some of the Subdhamadar Maharaj followers who were a little disenfranchised with a really sweet, sweet sannyasis from India, and they came, and some other BI branches came, and um, we um, tried to see what are the talents we have that we can engage in Prabhupada's service of reconciling the issues of science and religion. And so now we developed a talent pool um, one of the great brain trusts that helped me figure all this out, I couldn't have done it without him, was a Kandidi Prabhu. Because he was doing a similar initiative in England and we got together and he became my intellectual mentor to guide us on how to do this. And, um, and of course, uh, people like Druda Karma Prabhu, who's one of the foremost Bhaktivedanta Institute scientists and others helped us out and um, we put on, by Krishna's grace, a successful conference. So now our Bhaktivedanta Institute, um, we're not the only Bhaktivedanta Institute branch, but um, we like to work together with others. And we're in the process of pulling together about five different books right now. One of them is called Krishna and the Quark by Merle Gopal. A, uh, Krishna and the? And the Quark. 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 Okay. You know, That's uh, good. Okay. That book is in final editing by the BBT. We're doing another book unnamed, Is the Earth Flat? By the way, the answer is no, but that's based <laughs> on Fifth Canto and Sadaputra's work in modern science. Another book uh, by a Kandidi book called The Atma Paradigm, which he's presenting every Thursday afternoon now from England, um, that is uh, discussing can we understand consciousness as a purely material phenomena 
or is it not a material phenomena? And in a very thorough uh, scientific and Shastric analysis, um, so we have a series of books that we're working on. So that's what we do at the BI and any scientists uh, and philosophers uh, who see this little dialogue and want to work with the BI are, of course, very free to contact us. Oh, okay. Wonderful. So a lot of that would, to be that would be a paid advertisement. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so now if we consider scientific outreach, broadly it would mean that one is doing conferences and other is writing books. So these two, both things, you have achieved something significant or about to achieve something. That's uh, it's, it's uh, the momentum is getting forward. I just like to backtrack before we come to this. When you said Brahmanas need to be manage, facilitated, not managed. That was a profound point. Could you elaborate what that would mean sure. practically? I mean, if you have six Brahmins in a rule in a room and ask them what they want for lunch, there'll be seven seven choices. Because it's the way Brahmins are, are independent by nature, and um, what works best for Brahmins is to it um, like with Sadaputta, for example. The best thing I could do for him was facilitate his creativity by giving him the resources he needs and, and then encourage his creativity. It doesn't work well to suppress Brahmins. And in management, sometimes the Brahmins feel that way. So Brahmins um, tend not to be the best of managers. So yeah. they need that they need some management structure to work in, but that structure has to facilitate them, not stifle them. So how do we manage Brahmins by encouraging them and not stifling them? Now that is the art. And Subhadamadam Raj, I used to discuss it. I used to reveal how what a struggle it is for him to figure that out. He was very humble about things. Mm. A real struggle to figure that out. And he struggled with it. I, I, just as I'm struggling with it, the advantage I have is I have 50 years of being in the movement. So I've made enough mistakes to know not to do the same mistake again. That's your humility speaking. But I have seen in, in your interaction with devotees also how you try to accommodate everyone. And probably your experience from mediation will also help in resolving issues. Well, I, I joined ISKCON Resolve in the first mediation class in 2002. A uh, temple president here said, hey, it's your nature to be a mediator. ISKCON's going to start having mediators. Why don't you go for the training? And on a lark, I just went for the training. And from the first moment the trainer spoke, this was in New Jersey, or a class organized by Braja Bihari, um, the first moment he spoke, I moved to the edge of my chair. I was stuck because I had a problem, a personal problem, and I saw my way out of it through mediation. I'll reveal the personal problem. In the Gita, we talk about Samadarshana, the self-realized hmm. soul will see, you know, the Brahmin, the dog, the dog eater, the elephant, all is the same. That wasn't my life. I saw devotees, I saw karmis, I saw right, I saw wrong. I was seeing the world more black and white that I knew was reality. And I, I was very dissatisfied with myself seeing the world like that, but I didn't know what to do. And I saw getting mediation training as my way to achieve my own internal samadarshana, less judgmental. So I took to the training and I did a ton of training, I mean, thousands of hours of mediation training. And uh, now, uh, that's part of my seva for ISKCON is I do, I mediate complex cases. Um, and uh, it's just human nature for there to be conflict. This is discussed, especially in the eighth canto of the Bhagavatam. It, it, it's human nature. And uh, as devotees, we understand that flaw and we can do better. 
And so ISKCON Resolve, the intention is that we can do better and uh, we can be less judgmental against each other and try to get deeper understanding. And about 80% of the time, uh, when some dispute comes to Scott Resolve, parties walk away with a solution they can live with. And that, uh, papers have been written on this, very few religions take up conflict resolution because religions tend to have a, a hierarchy. And the hierarchy um, can interfere with human relations. It can interfere with the instructions of Upadeshamrita. We need a hierarchy, yet we also, more importantly, need good relationships. So it's gone resolved. It's just one little piece to help with that. We're not the okay. solution to all the problems of the world, the problems of this God, but in some little way, we're able to help with that. And so my own personal struggle with Samad Darshana has been helped a lot by ISKCON. Yeah. I don't want to judge. We all do it. But I, I you know, for myself, I, I want to work on rising above friends and enemies because friends and enemies is purely the mode of passion and uh, just like uh, even the demigods they have their mode of passion so they get in trouble like indra was cursed by Devarsa muni and yeah. then you know, they get defeated in battle and what do they do they approach lord brahma and then then in that discussion when they approach lord brahma and then brahma goes to the causal ocean, approaches Lord Vishnu, who he's actually never seen. And he offers prayers, and the prayers, he says, you're in the mode of goodness. And I thought that was very significant. His prayer said, Lord, you're pure goodness, meaning we're coming here with friends and enemies and passion, so help us raise our consciousness. So as devotees, just like as devotees, every morning, all of us take a bath. When I first went to India, I was so amazed to see even the poorest person would pour a bucket of water over their head in the morning. And in America, some people take a bath once a month if they need it or not. And uh, until this COVID virus came, so, so many times I would see people use a bathroom and not wash their hands. And in India, that was unheard of, just unheard of. So in this way, if we don't want our body to smell bad, we have to wash it every day. Similarly, if we don't want to be dragged down to the mode of passion or even ignorance, we have to constantly do things to bring us to goodness. So for me personally, working in mediation was a way to do it. Other people have other ways. I mean, I'm not saying this is the only way or the best way. Just for me, that's what I needed. Hmm. Yes. So, actually, it's like Krishna's plan because, uh, in a sense, you have the right set of skills which could help in revitalizing the Bhaktivedanta Institute in many ways. When I was introduced to Krishna consciousness, I was fascinated with the scientific presentation, especially through Origins and then through some other books. But I never saw any way I could directly engage myself in that. And so... I, of course, studied whatever I could and I used whatever channels I had to write and speak. But uh, in general, it seems that uh, institutions and intellectuals have a difficult time going together. And when I talk with several of uh, Srila Prabhupada's disciples who were intellectuals, you know, most, practically the whole movement was initially living in the temple. They were all brahmacharis, monks. But many of them left because they felt they saw no scope for intellectual growth in their life as brahmacharis. Because they would probably keep doing the same services again and again. Yeah. Now, over the years, if I was introduced in 1996, and even the last 10 years or so, 10, 15 years, I've seen a significant difference. And there is more freedom given, more broadness of vision about you know, how different devotees will need different amounts of space 
to be able to move forward in uh, in their particular services so is this a, you have also interacted with other religions this challenge of intellectuals and institutions is it there in every religion or every religious organization or is it something more related with us no it's all it's always there um it's always a challenge um it's a very important question you're asking um and uh, um there are different if we go into an ice cream store there are many flavors hmm as far as i'm concerned there's only they should only have one flavor chalk but other people prefer strawberry and some people like vanilla and so we're individuals we have different natures and different flavors and for us to deny our individuality is kind of dangerous i'll give an example let's say we're in a big city like bombay or new york and we plant a tree on the street when they plant a tree to get clean air and shade and whatever the first thing they do is they put a wire mesh around the tree you've seen that yourself they put a wire mesh yeah. to protect the tree from people bumping into it and dogs hurting it and everything and that wire mesh protects the tree so it can grow but as the tree starts growing if they don't remove that wire mesh that same wire mesh will stunt the tree's growth so similarly when we're new in the movement we're living in an ashram we have to get rid of so many misconceptions we cut off our hair we change our clothes we change our name we're trying to get rid of this bodily conception that i am this proud body and that training is so necessary and that's like the wire mesh to protect the sapling of our devotional life but as our devotional life grows that same wire mesh can stifle us So when do we remove that wire mesh and when don't we this requires intelligence when giri rai swami was called into prabhupad's room very shortly before prabhupad passed on 2 in the morning prabhupad said i want to see giri rai swami and prabhupad said how will this movement go on after me and giri rai swami said if i remember correctly we'll chant we'll do this we'll do that and prabhupad said no by intelligence organization this is what intelligence means we have to look at individuals and see what's best for them if we're iskon management my job if i'm management is to find out what your nature is just like krishna actually explored with arjuna what his nature is and then try to see how to facilitate your nature that is the perfection of our nashram management instead we often do it the reverse the manager says my dear devotee you should do anything for krishna and devotee is begging please can i do my nature that's reverse the devotee should be thinking i'll do anything for krishna and the manager is saying no i have to find your nature and engage you that way mm. that's the best management that's what works of course we all have emergencies we have a covid emergency so all of a sudden the temple is shut down and there's five devotees left so somebody may not be much of a pujari but that day they become a pujari in emergency mm-hmm. we'll do anything i mean we, we've all done everything in emergencies but if we live life in an emergency um that's not sustainable mm. it's just not sustainable and the same circumstances and may dictate different results take our juna it's a good example our juna received instructions from krishna and what did he do with those instructions he fought we mm. many of us had been to kurukshetra and he fought at that place he got the instructions krishna said to him very unusual for religious literature to say this okay i've told you everything now do what you want yeah that's an amazing deliberate and then do as you desire vimri shaita dashesena yathachita kuru that's very unusual yeah 
You don't find that in scriptures, other scriptures. So Krishna very unusual says, okay, and then Arjuna said, okay, I surrender. I'll do what you want. I'll, I know what to do now. Mm. Same circumstances. Fast forward to the future so many years. Krishna left the earth. Arjuna is practically defeated by some non-warrior cowherd men. And, yeah. and he's thinking of the same instructions Krishna gave him. The exact same instructions. He's remembering what Krishna said. And he does the opposite. Instead of fighting, he goes off to the mountains. Same instructions. And he does the opposite thing. That's called intelligence. Not being a mind, mindless. That's intelligence. Same instruction. Under one case, he did A. And then in another case, he did B with the same instructions. That's when Prabhupada said to Giri Swami, we need intelligence. That's what it means. That's profound. So that means, uh, going back to your example of the tree and uh, wire mesh around it, uh, intelligence means to know when that wire mesh has to be put and when it has to be removed both. Exactly. Mm. And all of us have been stifled by the wire mesh, and all of us have been protected by the wire mesh. And when to remove it requires us to have knowledge. To have knowledge, Prabhupada said it to me very clearly, to have knowledge, there's a step to getting knowledge. And the step is goodness. Okay. So as we cultivate in our own life, there's no easy way around it. We cultivate goodness. What do we do? We eat right. We try to sleep right. And, and we're, we're very Buddhist in that sense. Now, what does he mean by very Buddhist? By that, I mean the Buddhists have captured in the public domain the middle way. Everyone knows the Buddha as the middle way. Not too much, not too little. The Buddhists in, 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 in the popular literature capture the middle way. Krishna advocates the middle way like anything. For example, he says, don't sleep too much, but don't sleep too little. Don't eat too much, don't eat too little. Krishna actually talks a lot about the middle way. So I say sometimes we need to be better Buddhists as Krishna taught us to be. That's Take you. a middle way, not be so extreme. And in religions, it's very easy to have fanaticism because fanaticism means we're not thinking. Now, let me go on fanaticism. I'm not bashing, let's say, people who are on the left or people who are on the right. We but are both wired. Can be fanatical. Uh, uh, yeah, and I don't know which is worse, uh, but both can be. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, there was a great book I read that gave me a great inspiration called The Righteous Way by Jonathan Haidt. He's yeah. a brilliant social biologist. I think you might have read that. And in his chapter nine, he really explained to me what was going on in this guy. See, Jonathan was a um, very liberal political person from Philadelphia. And he won a... Um, Rhodes Scholarship or Fulbright Scholarship to go to India to study. And he was sent to Orissa. And Orissa is a very uh, traditional state in India. Very, very traditional in, in their ways. And his host family was a, a well-to-do family that put him up so he could do his sociological studies on his very high honor scholarship. And when he went there, his mind started screaming because the women would not eat until after the men ate. And every time a servant would do something for him, he would do what we're trained to do and by my culture is we would say the magic words of thank you. And his host kept reminding him, we don't thank the servants. And his brain was screaming at the, just screaming. This is horrible. This is horrific. This is exploitation. And this was going on and on. Finally, after about a month, he had an epiphany. Because he got to know the servants and they were quite happy. 
and he got to know the women and they were okay with it. And he realized that one size doesn't fit all. That his view of the world, there are more than one view of the world. And then that epiphany led to understand why the left and right can't understand each other. Because he said some people are wired more liberally, some people are wired more conservatively. So how do we get along with each other? And he came to the conclusion with mutual respect, which is precisely what Prabhupada said in several purports. I don't have them in front of me. I can pull them up quickly if need be. And of course, what Rupa Goswami discusses in the Upadesha Amrita, how we exchange our mind and confidence, we give and receive gifts. Mm -hmm. So these relationships among devotees allow the left and right to exist. Nowadays in ISKCON, there's major schism, like between uh, some, between men, women, between the view in India, the world, and the view in the West. And some people in India call the Western devotees liberals, and some Western devotees will call the India arch conservatives. But Prabhupada built a house we can all live in only if we're not fanatics. And we realize there's more than one way to look at the world. And my own experience being with Prabhupada is he, he definitely saw more than one way to look at the world. Prabhupada was the consummate diplomat. He knew how to engage a dip, diplomat. Diplomat, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, he was just a uh, um, brilliant diplomacy. And um, um, uh, that, that was Prabhupada's real, his tremendous strength that he knew how to deal with, with different people because his goal wasn't to prove he's right. His goal was to bring them to Krishna. Many anecdotal stories of that, you know, I, I, can, I can share and we can read. Uh, when I first met Prabhupada, I was kind of a mess. I lived in India. I lived in the most progressive, modern, least political state in India where I was a high school teacher. That was Bihar. That was a joke, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, um, and, 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 you know, I didn't exactly follow the regulative principle of intoxication very strictly. Well, I did follow it strictly. I got stoned every day. Um, so, um, <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, and and I didn't have a mirror, so I hadn't combed my hair. And since I got to India, you know, you know, the previous year, um, I was clean, but I I wasn't very groomed. And then I met Prabhupada, and that day when I met him, I gave up marijuana. That's all I was taking. I, I gave all that up because Prabhupada told me how I wanted to give it up. I knew it was destructive, but we have our habits. And um, I had all my own issues, but Prabhupada saw that I really wanted to know something. I had somehow or other previous life, I don't know what, I just wanted to know um, why people die. I just wanted to know, death didn't make sense to me. Something in me said you can't die. There's something that doesn't die, but people are dying and I couldn't reconcile it. And I, I went to India to try to reconcile this. And uh, Prabhupada understood there was a little, I had a somehow or other a little sincerity. And that's all he saw. He didn't see all my anartas. And that vision always struck with me how Prabhupada could have that vision. And he, sometimes Prabhupada would even make a little fun of me. But he did it in such a good way that it always touched the heart. So um, that was a lesson to me on how as devotees we have to deal with with each other. And this fanaticism where I'm right and you're wrong is very, very dangerous. And every religion in the world faces this, faces this issue.
This, the, 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 the number one divisive issue right now among religions of the world is how to deal with people who are gay. It's the number one divisive issue. Mm. According to the scholars of religion. And now, different times, it's different issues. I know how Prabhupada dealt with it. I saw it. And... Um, um, There's several so, points. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, several, go on. Yeah, several points in what you said. First is that... Uh, like, the universality of this conflict and your example of how Shri Prabhupada dealt with it. So that also means that uh, I, I was struck by one point, hierarchy interferes with the sixfold loving exchanges. That's such a, such a vital point. As soon as somebody is, I have several friends and they told me that, you know, as soon as they got a managerial position, their friends stopped opening up to them. And their, man, their managerial position started interfering with their uh, with their friendships, so it's it's a so it's not just for intellectuals; it's for almost every one of us. But probably for intellectuals, it becomes quite easy to justify one's own views using the using the intelligence or the intellect, and then that makes and so there is a moral dimension to one's righteousness, and there is also an intellectual dimension to one's righteousness. And both can get reinforced when somebody is an intellectual, or at least thinks that they are thinks that they are an intellectual. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. yeah, okay, go on. Just a few thoughts. I mean, I was just reflecting, and then you could uh, reflect on that. And so, I would also like to discuss because you recommended that righteous mind to me, and I also went through it. And I would like to discuss some specific points from that book to how they could oh, apply yeah. to our discussion, our, our moment's context. But any responses on what I spoke just now? About hierarchy, yeah. interfering, and friendship, and everything? We have to be Buddhists again. I know we take a middle way. I mean, it's obvious somebody becomes a manager. Um, you know, management means there's a pie. And the pie is never big enough, but you have to divide it. Hmm. It's hard. It, 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 I mean, it's never big enough. And um, if it's a cheesecake, I can assure you it's never big enough for me. <laughs> uh, yeah, key, key lime cheesecake pie freshly off the altar is never big enough for me. So, um, it, 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 so uh, nevertheless, managers... Yeah, the relationship can change a little, but what makes management work is the emotional bank account of the manager. Mm. Like, for example, I work very closely at times with Rod and Aswami. Yeah. And uh, we work together, we've been friends for decades. And I work with him at times on different projects. And I noticed he always invests a huge amount of effort in, into his relationships. So he has a huge emotional bank account. And when he needs to press a management button, he, he has the um, emotional bank account to make a withdrawal if it needs to be done. In other words, let's say taking somebody, a disciple who has some issues, but there's such a strong relationship that he can go and even necessarily chastise and the disciple will accept it because there's a good emotional bank account. He's made so many deposits, he can make a withdrawal. But if we become a management and we have a, a zero emotional bank account and we keep making withdrawals and we go into deficit and, and we end up bankrupt. Yeah. So uh, 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 it's important any of us that have have to manage that we invest a lot in the emotional bank account, even more so than before. And and with relationships, because sometimes we're going to have to make withdrawals because um, we have to make decisions and do things. And we have to decide what to do with this pie. There's eight pieces and 16 people want, want some of it. What do we do? 
Mm. It's never it's never easy. And sometimes as managers, we can actually figure out what to do. And sometimes as managers, we have to do the dropity management style. You know what that is? It's depend on Krishna. Krishna, it's up to you. I can't do anything. <laughs> and we have to have intelligence to when to know when uh, um, uh, when we're in the Yudhisthira management style or when we're in the Draupadi management style. They're both different. And we have to have the intelligence to know which one is appropriate for the time. To get that intelligence, again, it goes back to doing everything we can to keep our mind clean. Just like we work every day to keep our body clean, we have to every day work to get our mind closer to goodness. And I assure you, I can say from personal experience, um, um, that it takes work to, it takes a lot of work. And if I forget to do that work, um, I experience the symptoms of the mode of passion. I see distinctions that aren't there. I'll get, uh, 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 I'll get angry. I'll, all these negative things might come. Hmm. Yes, bro. So, I like the pie example also, and it really succinctly conveys the problem of management. So sometimes management forces us to do things which will be displeasing to some people. It's just the way it is. Now going on to this point of, because we are discussing two distinct topics about say, yes. the intellectual aspect and uh, liberal conservative. So you mentioned how you found Prabhupada was quite accommodating so that devotees would be encouraged to practice bhakti. Mm -hmm. So now there is also this aspect that uh, when I studied Jonathan Head's book, he mentions that there are, there are certain things which everybody values. For example, fairness, kindness. But there are three things which he says that uh, which there's a difference. There is uh, authority, morality, and purity. Mm, so these are relatively much more important for conservatives. And uh, often those who are liberals have a more, you could say, utilitarian view of this. That, you know, okay, we have authority structure. If it works, use it. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. Mm. And similarly, sanctity. So with respect to sanctity, I, after I have been in India and I traveled abroad, I've seen one significant difference that say, for many Indians, just the physical body of the text, the Sanskrit recitation of the verses, that has, you could say, a lot of sacramental value. But for many devotees who come from the West, it is more of the wisdom in the book. You know, okay, recitation of verses is good. If you can do it, that's fine. But it's more of a, some of the word utilitarian has a negative connotation to it. But the point is that the considerations of purity and also the consideration of authority, that there, I remember one of the, I mentioned this recently to another devotee also, that uh, in, in India, the spiritual master and the disciples, it's a very vertical discussion, vertical relationship. Often the disciple will sit on the floor, the spiritual master will sit on a chair. But in the West, even the spiritual master and disciple, it's a more very horizontal kind of really interaction. Oh, that. So there are certain cultural differences. So when I went to America and I saw this difference, the spiritual master and disciple, I, that's why I, was, I had met one spiritual master and he wanted some book. And he went to the room, another room where his assistant was sitting. And in India, probably the spiritual master would have rang a bell or something and the assistant would have come running. But he went to the assistant's room. And when he went to that room, the assistant kept sitting on his chair and the spiritual master was standing and they were talking. So it was quite jolting for me. But neither the spiritual master nor the disciple seemed to make any issue out of it. It was just normal for them. So it seems that the, the idea of how exactly one should relate to the spiritual master the how there is acceptance of authority, but how the dynamics within the authority and the subordinates play out, that is significantly different. 
So do and you thank say that, yeah. yeah, so would you say that broadly speaking, although of course India is more than a million billion people and America is also huge and there'll be diverse mindsets, but is there something like a civilizational ethos which uh, makes Americans more liberal and Indians more conservative? Well, I mean, um, we have many conservatives in America too. Um, um, and this is discussed in the Bhakta Rasamrita Sindhu, the topic you brought up. And in the fifth chapter, it's discussed that there are details and principles of devotional service. Yeah. So the principle is very simple. Uh, one has a guru. It's one of the top principles given. The detail is the relationship between the guru and disciple. That's a detail. It's not a principle. Respect is there, but exactly how it's done. Um, in uh, more traditional plays, every time the disciple sees the guru, he may offer obeisances. Um, I know many gurus who find that quite distracting. I'm talking to you, and now I can't understand what you're saying because your head's on the ground. No, just offer obeisance in the morning and be done with it already. Come on. Or let's say we're preaching on a college campus and somebody comes out there and all of a sudden people are, are hitting the dirt. It turns students off like anything. What's our real point? Is our real point to bring people to Krishna or is our real point to show that we can follow rituals? Now, it depends on time, place, and circumstances. There's a saying, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. So when I'm in India, I would expect, because it's the culture, um, and um, we would um, be a little more traditional. Uh, Prabhupada always authorized women to go on the altar every place in the world except Vrindavan. Because in Vrindavan, it, the, he said, we'll just get criticized too much. So he didn't. So Prabhupada wasn't concerned about making a statement about women's liberation, nor concerned. Uh, that wasn't his concern. His concern was what will best give us the opportunity to present Krishna. So in a traditional place, we might do more traditional things. In a liberal place, we might do more liberal things. Prabhupada was very liberal when the devotees went to Prabhupada. Everyone who joined the movement in the early, very early days was in their 20s, still growing, and milk, Prabhupada, I thought was very important for the brain. So one devotee went to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, the only milk we can get, and there was no other choice, was milk that had vitamin D in it. At that time, vitamin D came from fish oil. You might know this story. So Prabhupada, we no longer can have milk. Prabhupada said, what can you do? You're growing brains, you have to have milk. He knew we needed the protein. So Prabhupada was very traditional and very liberal all at the same time because his overriding principle was he made a clear distinction between the principles and details of devotional service. And the details can be adjusted for whatever is favorable for spreading Christian consciousness, as Rupa Goswami says, and discard what's unfavorable. That was Prabhupada's overriding principle. To understand Prabhupada, the worst thing we can do, I asked one very senior member of the movement, so what's the worst thing ISKCON can do? What's the biggest danger for ISKCON, I asked. And he gave me, without even thinking, gave me the, most, the smartest answer, and it still rings in my ears. And the answer was, Greatest danger for ISKCON is Prabhupada says. Just quoting Prabhupada without context, without intelligence. Because Prabhupada on almost any issue said more than one thing, sometimes opposite. Just like Arjuna, he took Krishna's instructions and one time fought and one time ran off to the mountain. Same instruction. So Prabhupada was very nuanced. Prabhupada wanted us, he wanted us to drink milk because he wanted good brains so we can make good decisions. Well, in order to make good decisions, we have to think about things. And if we just say, well, 
uh, Prabhupada said this, Prabhupada said that, and quote each other, then we're leaving out hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is a science of how to understand scripture. And Prabhupada gave us hermeneutics called Guru Shastra Sadhu, but he gave a whole hermeneutical system of how to understand things, when to contextualize, when to accept as actual as actual statements. In every single volume of the Bhagavatam, Prabhupada says in the very beginning of every single volume in the preface, he refers to that verse um, in, in the first canto, I think it was 15th chapter, I'm trying to remember. He said, though imperfectly composed, thoroughly honest people will accept what I'm saying, just like in a fire brigade. You don't have to speak the same language. You just know to pass the buckets of water. He said, I'm writing in a foreign language, so please excuse any any problems. What did Prabhupada mean by that? And it's in the preface to every volume of the Bhagavatam. So when something's repeated that much, it's important. What did he mean? Well, to me, Prabhupada's English was fine. When he says he's writing a foreign language, Prabhupada's English, his vocabulary was more expansive than most of us. He went to Scottish Church College. He had a very good education. Um, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati saw how you know, his English was quite erudite. I need a dictionary to read Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, and yeah. I do. And, and, and so he recognized right away that Prabhupada was very erudite. He said, okay, you go to the West. He said, from the very beginning, his very first instruction, last instruction of Prabhupada. So Prabhupada's English is fine, but when he, so what, what does it mean when Prabhupada says, I'm speaking a foreign language? To me, it means in a cultural foreign language. He's speaking culturally different because Prabhupada understood it, that it's culturally different. So he says, some of the things I say may not come across clearly because of cultural differences. Prabhupada recognized it. He spoke about it, not just in a preface at other times. So that means it takes some intelligence to understand what Prabhupada is saying. And if we just quote Prabhupada to each other, then we don't understand each other. I'm not saying we don't quote Prabhupada. I quote Prabhupada all the time. I hope everyone in the movement is quoting Prabhupada. But to throw quotes at each other, try to solve an argument, is not what Prabhupada intended for us to do. Because that's not an intelligent way to look at it. When um, I said to Prabhupada, um, discussing some philosophical issue, and I said, Krishna says, he says, leave Krishna out of this, discuss philosophy. And he said that to other people too, not just me. In other words, don't just quote something. Give me some good philosophical. Devotees are very good at knowing the philosophy. But we need to train devotees, myself included, I need to be trained in understanding philosophy, which means how to think, how to know hermeneutics and teleology and epistemology so that we can present Krishna consciousness to the intelligent class of people. We have to know these skills. Our mission at the Bhaktivedanta Institute is to combine philosophy and science. And by philosophy, I mean epistemology and teleology and ontology and all these branches and combine them together so that we can present Krishna consciousness in a way that people have, wow, that's worth thinking about. And once we get there, then we're successful. Amazing. I like this profound, it's profound that Prabhupada said, leave Krishna out of this. That means yeah. Prabhupada said that just discuss based on reasoning. That, that, yeah. that, that, that the time when quoting authority is important and there is a time when doing reasoning could be important. Both are important. And you've written on this topic very, very well. I mean, I yeah. love your writing, Chaitanya Dryden. I think you're one of the best writers in, in the movement because you're clear, you're focused, you say what you're going to say, you say it, and then you say what you said. So we understand what you're doing. It's a really, I mean, I, I, I just wish I could be as clear as you are in your presentations. I mean that. I mean, I really do. And, 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 and there are times to quote Shastra, and there are times to do philosophy, and Prabhupada was brilliant at knowing time, place, and circumstance. None of us will ever be as good as Prabhupada was at that, but we can try. It's amazing. Thank you for your kind words about me also. You know, I try to just organize thoughts as well as I can. So maybe 
now i will summarize what we discussed today and we could continue in the future also this is a lot uh, to discuss but i don't want to yes so we discussed about the history of intellectual outreach and how during prabhupad's times uh, is very vibrant then there's a you made the point that we learned over the years how to facilitate brahmanas rather than manage them and how we could we need to ba- balance of autocracy and democracy and then within that we discussed about how for devotees it's like growing a tree initially you need a wire mesh and then it needs to be removed and when what is to be done that requires intelligence to understand and uh, we discuss also about conservatism and liberalism and broadly we talked about how prabhupad knew when to focus on the principles and he adjusted the details accordingly and your experiences with prabhupad also and he concluded by talking about how shri prabhupad stressed on knowing in context not that the it was quite a i would say a radical statement to say that prabhupad says can be a big danger for our movement that the authority quoted without context can actually be counterproductive in other context so prabhupad wanted reasoning thinking so we could say that scripture provides us for the provides the content of thinking but we need philosophical training to know how to actually go about doing that thinking and and i think uh, the academic outreach through bakkan institute is providing opportunity for that maybe in future we can have a discussion about because a large community of our devotees are indians either in india or in the west also so how they and we have a lot of devotees who are from engineering background and they would like to do something in the area of science and spirituality so what are the opportunities open for them maybe we could discuss that in a future session if you would be willing to i would love to i would love to i get emails two three times a week now cuz we're starting to get um some traction on our bi outreach and devotees that want to engage we have something called bi connect which is an online forum that has biology engineering different divisions where devotees can break out into groups and discuss topics and there's another conference i uh i started and uh, i moderate uh, along with uh arya devi and that is a uh, vast vaishnav advanced studies these are mostly for devotees with advanced degrees or devotees who have like yourself were very well studied and uh, it's a confidential place where devotees involved in academics can discuss very hard issues in a, in a in a private way so we have uh, the vast resource we have the bi connect which is we're go- we're going to start we've been practicing it ramananda in england is doing this and we're going to start rolling it out more publicly within the next month because now we got the kinks out of it where devotees like this can engage we're looking you know for writers editors many devotees who are involved in the sciences especially indians i see this is what they often do they build a firewall and they have my day job and my devotional life and they don't mix because in day i'm very scientific and in night i'm very devotional and there shouldn't be a mixing part of the bi's mission is to chop that knock that wall down because it doesn't have to exist but to knock that wall down what well, we need good understanding of science good understanding of philosophy good understanding of shastra and with that now is prabhat's intent for the bi for his devotees that we can gradually bring that wall down and um mm. it's hard work and so uh, i w- w- love the opportunity to um a uh, prophet once said about indians now, i don't know if this applies now but he said it back then in the 70s said indians they're only one step from krishna facing the wrong way he said the americans you're 10 steps but you're facing the right way now mm-hmm. sociology has changed and i don't know how much that applies now or is it to then but um uh, indians do have 
a special birth, and as Lord Chaitanya says, a special mission. Hmm. They have a special mission. And Prabhupada, uh, when he was with the Indians, always reminded them of that special mission. So um, um, uh, the idea, uh, and when we create this artificial barrier, oh, Indians are better than Americans because they're more conservative, or Americans are better than Indians because they're, uh, they have uh, broader vision. Yeah, I hear people say this. Where these barriers are based on the false bodily concept that I am American and I am Indian, and that ruins the whole movement. Bodily concept doesn't help the movement. Okay. Okay, but we'll talk about that in the future. I think our time is about up because you have an, another interview coming. But you're a great interviewer. You bring out things that I didn't even know I had inside me. Oh. Thank you. It was very insightful, and I look forward to having future discussions. Humble obeisances. Thank you very much.